Welcome to Fairy Tale Fritz. If you enjoy fairy tales and bedtime stories, please hit the subscribe button in the bottom right corner and you will receive updates and more tales. Today's tale is from my friend Langeling. It was written by Wilhelm Hauf and published in 1826, just a year before Hauf died of typhoid fever at the age of 24. The title is Zwergnase, which means Dwarf Nose. Part 1 In a well-known town in Germany, there lived for many years a cobbler and his wife. The cobbler repaired shoes and boots and made new ones when he had money to buy the leather, while the wife sold the fruits and vegetables that she grew in their little garden. Many customers came to her stand at the marketplace, drawn in by her tidiness and how neatly she arranged her wares. This worthy couple had one boy by the name Jacob. Jacob was eight years old, handsome and well-grown. He helped his mother at the stand, and sometimes he delivered the customer's purchases to their homes. One day, as the cobbler's wife was sitting at the marketplace and little Jacob stood near calling out the prices of her vegetables, there came an old woman, rather shabbily dressed, with a thin, pinched face, red eyes, and a long, pointed nose. She was leaning on a long staff, and she hobbled and halted as if she had painful corns on her feet, and she looked as if every moment she might lose her balance and fall flat on her nose. Are you Hannah, the vegetable woman? She asked, wagging her head. Let me see if you have what I want. And with her ugly brown hands, she sifted through the cabbages, breaking their leaves, poking here and there with her long, skinny fingers. When she had disarranged all the baskets, she grumbled. Bad stuff, wretched cabbages. They were much better fifty years ago. Bad stuff. These remarks made little Jacob angry, and he cried. Listen, you horrid old woman. You call our vegetables bad stuff, and with your long nose you sniff and smell at them so that no one else will care to buy them? Just so you know, the cook of the Grand Duke buys from us all the time. The woman looked at the boy and answered sharply. You seem to be delighted by my nose, young lad. One day you will have one just like it, an even longer one. She picked through the cauliflowers again and threw them back into the basket, muttering, Bad cauliflowers, bad stuff. Make up your mind about what you want, returned the shoemaker's wife, indignant at the waste of time. That would be better than talking nonsense to my boy. I will take these six cauliflowers, said the old woman. But I cannot carry them home. Let your boy come along with me and I will pay him for his trouble. The boy did not want to go, but his mother persuaded him, for she thought it would be wrong to let the feeble old dame carry such a heavy load. And half protesting, Jacob went. The old woman walked slowly and it was almost an hour before they reached a little house outside of the town. She opened the door and Jacob was quite surprised when he entered, for the inside of this house was beautiful. The walls and staircases were of marble, the furniture ebony inlaid with gold, the floors of glass so highly polished that Jacob slipped and fell. The old woman took a whistle out of her pocket, blew it, and immediately some guinea pigs came in, and Jacob noticed with amusement that they wore men's clothes, and they walked on their hind legs. Where are my slippers? shrieked the old woman, shaking her stick at them so that they were quite frightened. They came back again directly with two cocoa nut shells soled with leather, and the old woman put them on. Now she began to bustle about. She took Jacob by the hand and went quickly across the glass floor. At last, she took him into a room, something like a kitchen. Sit down, little man, she said, and pushed him into the corner of the couch. You have had a heavy load to carry. Men's heads are not light. What do you mean, men's heads? cried the boy. They were cauliflowers that I brought here. Now you know that is a lie, <laughs> laughed the old woman. 
and she took a man's head out of the basket. The boy was terrified, for he thought if this got known to his mother, she would be in sore trouble. I must give you a little present, said the old woman. Wait a moment and you shall have some delicious soup. She whistled, and there entered several guinea pigs in men's clothes with aprons on and cooking spoons stuck through their waist belts. After them came several squirrels in white Turkish trousers. They also walked on their hind legs and wore green velvet caps on their heads. They bustled about and brought saucepans and dishes, and the old woman ran hither and thither in her cocoa nut slippers, and Jacob saw she was evidently going to give him something good to eat. At last, something in one of the pots began to boil over, and the smell filled the room. The woman took it off the fire, poured the contents into a silver soup bowl, and said, Now, son, if you drink this soup, you will have everything that you admire in me. You might become an excellent cook, too, except you would never be able to find the particular kind of cabbage of which this soup is made. Most certainly your mother does not sell it at her stand. The boy hardly understood what she meant, but he drank the soup eagerly, and it tasted delicious. His mother had often made good things for him to eat, but nothing like this. While he was drinking the last spoon, the whistle sounded for the guinea pigs, and thick plumes of smoke began to fill the room. The smoke confused little Jacob. He wanted to get away. He said he ought to be going back to his mother, but he seemed unable to move, and he fell back onto the couch and fell fast asleep. Strange dreams befell him. It seemed to him that he was changed into a squirrel, and he went about with the other squirrels and the guinea pigs, and he had his little chores just like the others. At first he had to work as a cobbler. As he had often helped his father, he did not find that too difficult. After a time, pleasanter work was given to him. He had to go with some of the squirrels to get sunberries. The old dame preferred a certain kind, and she had no teeth. She made her dinner off bread and sunberries. After a year, he was set to find drinking water for the old woman. This was done in many different ways. The squirrels and Jacob had to fill the hazelnut shells with dew from the roses, and that was her drinking water. Since she was always thirsty, her water carriers had plenty to do. After another year, Jacob had indoors work to do, chiefly to keep the glass floors clean. He had to sweep them and then tie his feet up in clothes and dust them. In four years' time, he was put in the kitchen, and Jacob, from scullery boy, became head pastry cook. And his skill was so great that he was sometimes surprised of himself. Pastries of 200 different flavors and the most delicate cabbage soups everything he could make with the greatest ease. After he had been in the old woman's service for seven years, it happened one day when she had gone out with basket and staff that Jacob had to draw fowl and stuff and roast it before she came back. In the herb room, he suddenly noticed a cupboard he had not seen before. He looked in it and found inside a great many baskets of herbs. He opened one and found a herb of quite different color. He looked carefully at it. It smelled strong and like the soup that the old woman had given him on his first day. But the smell was so strong that he began to sneeze and sneeze and sneeze until at last, sneezing, he awoke. He was lying on the old woman's sofa and looked bewildered. What strange things dreams are, said he. I could have sworn that I had been a squirrel. In fact, I was a squirrel cook. How my mother will laugh when I tell her, but how she will scold me for sleeping away from home instead of helping her. His limbs were stiff from the long sleeping, and so was his neck, and every moment when he moved he either hit the wall with his nose or when he turned over, banged it against the doorpost. The squirrels and guinea pigs ran busily here and there as if they would accompany him, 
but they gave it up as they saw him leave the house and took their nutshells inside, and by and by he heard them chattering in the distance. He felt very anxious as he got near the marketplace. His mother sat in her usual place and had plenty of vegetables in her baskets. He could not have slept long, but it seemed to him that she was very sad, for instead of calling to the passers-by, she sat with her head resting on her hand, and as he came nearer, he saw she was looking paler than usual. At last he summoned his courage and said, Mother, are you angry with me? His mother turned around and shrieked with fright. Go away, horrid dwarf, said she. I do not like such jokes. But mother, look at me, I'm Jacob, your son. Now this is really too much, cried Hannah. There stands a hideous dwarf who says, I am your son, your Jacob. Shame on you. Then all the market women came to try and comfort this poor Hannah, whose fine body had been stolen seven years ago. Poor Jacob did not know what to think. They called him a hideous dwarf and spoke of seven years ago. What had happened to him? When he saw that his mother would have nothing to do with him, he went with tears in his eyes to the booth where his father worked at his shoemaking and stood by the door and looked in. The master was so busy that he did not notice him, but chancing to look round, he cried out, Good heaven! What is that? What is that? Good day, said Jacob, stepping in. How are you? Badly, little man, answered his father, to Jacob's surprise, for it seemed he was not recognized. I am so lonely and old and weak. Have you no one who can help you? asked Jacob. Where is your son? God knows, answered the cobbler. Seven years ago he was stolen from the marketplace. Seven years ago, cried Jacob. Yes, little man, seven years ago, an ugly old woman came to the market, tumbled about my wife's vegetables, and bought so many that she could not carry them herself. My wife, good soul, sent our boy along with her, and we have never seen him since. And is that seven years ago, you say? Seven years next spring. We sought him everywhere. The town crier cried him, but all to no avail. So spoke Jacob's father and returned to his last. Jacob realized now that he had not been dreaming, but that for seven years he had worked as a squirrel for the old woman. He stood there for some time, thinking over his strange fate. And then his father said, Do you want anything, young man? A pair of slippers? Or a case for your nose? Why, what is the matter with my nose? Why should I want a case for my nose? asked Jacob. Well, if I had such a terrible nose, said the shoemaker, I should put a red patent leather cover over it. You might do worse, little man. Jacob was dumbfounded. He felt his nose. It was about eight inches long. Oh, for pity's sake, let me look in the glass, said he. It is not for vanity's sake. I don't have one, but if you want to look into a mirror, go over to the barber urban. He has one as big as your head. With these words, he pushed Jacob out of the door and went back to work. The boy headed over to the barber, whom he had known for many years. Good morning, urban, cried he. Will you let me look into your mirror glass? With pleasure, laughed the barber. You are a handsome youth and a little bit vain, I'm thinking. As the barber spoke, a current of laughter rolled through the salon. The dwarf, however, stepped to the glass and looked at himself. Tears came to his eyes. How dreadful he looked. His eyes were tiny, his nose hideous. It hung down over his mouth and chin. His head was deep set between his shoulders. His back and chest were humpy like a well-filled sack. His clumsy body had thin, short legs, but his arms were long, his hands brown, his fingers thin and bony, and when he stretched them out, they touched the floor. He was the most misshapen dwarf ever seen. 
Have you gazed long enough, my prince? said the barber as he laughingly looked at him. Come, enter my service, little man. You shall have whatever you ask for. If you only stand at my doors every day and invite the people to step in, I shall get more customers, and each will give you a present. Jacob was annoyed at this proposition, but it could not be helped. He told the barber he had no time for such service and ran away. He intended, however, to pay a final visit to his mother. So Jacob went to the market and begged his mother to listen to him. He reminded her of the past and told her that the old woman had turned him into a squirrel and had kept him there for seven years. The cobbler's wife knew not what to say to this, and she thought she had better talk it over with her husband. She went with the dwarf to the shoemaker's bench and said, Listen, this dwarf says he's our long-lost son Jacob and he has told me how he has been for seven years bewitched. Wait a minute, said the cobbler. I told him all that an hour ago, and now he goes to you with the tale. Take care, boy, or I will have you locked up. He took a bundle of shoe soles that he had just cut and beat the dwarf over the back and arms so severely that he screamed and ran off. Jacob found no one who pitied him or took compassion on him, and he had to sleep that night on the stone steps of the church. When the morning came, he went into the church and prayed. Then he suddenly remembered that he could easily earn a living as a cook, and that the Grand Duke was fond of eating, and that he loved a good table. And so Jacob went to the palace to be continued.